extreme tension. Everything you tie on a hook should be at breaking strength of the thread. And whatever you tie on the hook, you have to first use thread torque as your friend. You don't set something on top of the hook and tie it on. It'll spin around. So lean it towards you. Then take a loose loop and then gradually tighten it until it's almost ready to break. That was AK Best with one of his fly tying tips from the podcast today. The sacks, drugs, and fly tying today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I'm excited to share our second podcast that uh, is out, and uh, you can catch it right now if you go to outdoorsonline.co. This podcast is focused on helping fly fishing businesses and brands get their uh, build their influence online. So if you get a chance, we'd love it if you can go out there and check it out and maybe share it with one other person you know who's who's got a business. Uh, today, I've got AK Best on, who has influenced a ton of fly tires over the years with uh, nine books, including uh, one of his big ones, Production Fly Tying. We find out how you should take a picture of the natural insect. We hear about uh, some of his go-to Colorado patterns and the uh, reason why joining the Army may have saved his life. A quick word from our sponsor, GotFishing.com is your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. You'll never pay a dime extra for the trip you book, and in many cases, less than advertised. Find out where GotFishing could take you by heading over to GotFishing.com today. That's G-O-T Fishing.com, or reach them by phone at 208-630-3373. GotFishing.com, the easiest place to start your next fishing adventure. So... Without further ado, here's AK Best. How's it going, AK? It's going well, thank you. Good. It is uh, great to have you on here. We're going to dig into some of your background. We just off there briefly, we were talking about John Gearock. He was way back in episode somewhere in the 40s, and, and we talked about um, you and your influence on him and some of that stuff. So I think we're going to dig into some of that and some dry flies, but can you just start us off and talk about how you first got into fly fishing? Uh, I moved from Iowa to the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan, a place called Alpena. It was uh, just above the 45th parallel, which meant we had long, cold winters. But I also discovered brook trout there, and uh, that changed my life. Uh, I learned how to dry fly fish because the streams in Michigan the stream bottoms are littered with the dregs of the logging era, a lot of white cedar, which didn't rot, and the streams were, bottoms were covered with that. And if you nymph fish, you're going to lose nymphs. So I learned how to keep the fly on top, and I learned how to dry fly fish, and that's, I've never been a good nymph fisherman since. That's, that's how it gets. And I learned to tie dry flies because the ones I could buy didn't look anything like what I was seeing on the water. Huh. Nice. March yeah. brown, March browns, for example, are not brown. They're tan. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, so you started digging into tying and what, what, uh, I mean, what was that like your process of getting into tying dries? Cause dries aren't easy. I mean, you've written some books and things like that. Um, but how did that process go for you? Well, I go to the gas station. Uh, was the other place you could buy flies, and most of them in those days, this is back in the early 60s, uh, most all of them were tied in China. And uh, But I took a razor blade, and I cut the thread at the head and unwound them to see how it was put together. <laughs> and then I would try to replicate that using materials that most naturally ma- looked like the naturals. And through trial and error, I learned how to tie flies. And, self-taught. It was self-taught. And what year was that roughly when you started tying? 1964. 64. So, so you didn't uh, you didn't really have a mentor, any mentors. You just kind of jumped into it and, and looked at the naturals yeah. and yeah. 
And, yeah. And when did it come to be when you, I mean, we've talked, I, I sent a message out in the Facebook group, um, our group we have and mentioned you were coming on and, you know, a lot of people responded and, and I know, you know, um, they talked a lot about one of your books is production, uh, fly tying, uh, had a big impact right. on, on a lot of people. Can you talk about how that book came to be? Uh, yeah, it was an interesting story. Uh, hardly anyone has ever asked to write a book. <laughs> but John John Gerock and the publisher Jim Pruitt took me to lunch one day and they said, AK, we think you should write a book about fly tying. And I said, Well, gee. Uh we talked about that for a while and I went home and uh, thought, Okay, I've got a lot of fly tying books, but they're pretty much all the same. I want to do something a little different. I want to write a book where it deals with uh the tailing. For example, on a dry fly, and uh, I explained how to tie the dry fly using any kind of tailing material you could think of that would match almost any other part of the dry fly. And the next chapter was on bodies, from dub body to quill body to you name it, mm-hmm. all the different bodies, and then all the different kinds of wings and those techniques. I thought, okay, if you're tying something you just saw in the water and it's brown. Here's the brown tailing. Tie that in. Here's what you might want to use for the body. Okay, use that. What color are the wings? Okay, tie those on. How about the hackle? How do you tie in the hackle so it's not cone-shaped anymore? And uh, it it sort of led to that. And then the book is now in its third uh, edition. Hmm. And. and and production, you know, when you hear the word production fly tying, you think of somebody that's whipping out, uh, you know, hundreds of dozens of flies. Was that the part of the focus on, you know, the title in that book? Uh, yeah, but it's sort of, it takes a left-hand turn. A production fly tire, a professional, wants the last fly he ties, say, number 16 Adams. He wants the last one to look like the first one. Twelve dozen. They all look alike. If you're an amateur and you're set down to tie two flies, you want the second one to look like the first one. You're facing the same problem as a professional tire. How do you do that? How do you you relate the material you're tying on the hook to the natural? How long is the tail? How tall are the wings? Uh, Is the body ribbed? Is it shiny? Does it reflect light or does it soak up water? Uh, Yep. There's no such thing. I, I, when I was teaching and, and playing professionally as a musician, somebody once told me, and this is held in my head for years later, there's no such thing as an unimportant item. Pay attention. Don't just pay attention. Pay absolute attention. If you're going to be a success as a professional musician, that's what you must do. And I made my life for a long time as a professional musician because I could sight read. <laughs> and uh, my senior year in college, I played every night of the week from Easter Sunday to the following year, Easter Sunday. One-nighters all over the state and the edges of the surrounding states. I was pretty damn good because I could read. <laughs> and some... If somebody in the sack section was ill or they couldn't make it, they'd give me a call, and I could go read the book. Right. Wow. <laughs> that I think. Uh, so, did you uh, know? Yeah. For example, ahead. absolute absolute attention. Did you know that all mayflies have antenna? Uh no. I guess I mean I no I didn't. <laughs> Next time you pick up a, a mayfly and take a careful look, they all have tiny little antenna. Uh huh. I'm not saying you have to put that on the fly you're tying, but now you are seeing with absolute attention. Are are you, would you consider yourself uh, kind of an etymologist or somebody in, uh, you know, somebody who really studies bugs? Uh, I don't think I'm an entomologist so much as I take a lot of photos, Mm. macro photography of the naturals. Uh, these were back in the day. These were slides, and I could put the, project a slide on the screen and make a size 18 blueing olive three feet long. And I'd stand there <laughs> with a yardstick and measure 
How long is the tail in relation to the length of the hook? How tall are the wings in relation to the hook? How much of the hook is used for the head? How much of the hook is used for the body? How much is used for the wings and hackle? Once you start tying a fly and automatically save out the length of the head, the hook eye for the head, you've just now taken a certain percentage of the entire length of the fly. <laughs> the rest of it has to fit behind that. And those those are the kinds of things that uh, I, I guess you'd call it anal compulsive. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you're so you're more on the I mean getting things exact. There is that you know school of thought where you think are you tying exact imitations or are you tying more suggestive? Of it? What would you say your your style is? I think I think my style is exact imitation. Yeah. Uh, for example. Uh, the famous hatch here, the Colorado green drake tied on a size 12 hook. The tail of that fly is exactly one and a half times a hook gap <laughs> length space. The wings on the natural are as tall as the entire length of the fly from the beginning of the eye to the tip of the tail. It looks really weird to tie a fly with wings that tall. Mm -hmm. But guess what? It's the key. It's the key to the window. When that fly comes in the window, it's a trigger to the trout. The first thing they see in that window is the wingtips. Mm. Uh, there's a great author who did uh, an explanation of that. I'm going to end my room here and look for the oh, name yeah. of the book. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll put uh, a I'll put a link once you find it. I'll put a link in the show notes so people can uh, hopefully we can check that book out. Um, oh, what the hell's new? And if you can't find it, AK, I, I, I got to go. I got yeah. If, if you can't, a uh, we in can, the ring of the in the ring of the rise, uh, yeah. Vince Marinero. Okay, he's the guy who did a series of photographs of the what is a trout window. The closer the trout is to the surface, the smaller that ring of window is. Mm. In other words, if he's two inches from the surface, that little window is not more than six inches. Mm. If he's if he's holding six inches lower, it's probably a foot and a half. But either way, the first thing the trout sees in that window are the wingtips. I've heard a lot of people say, well, they don't think wings on a dry fly are important. And I know the reason why they say that. They ha they're having trouble tying them on. <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they, they tie on a little longer hackle, maybe. But the wingtips uh, is the first thing the trout sees. And there's another, another thing I've bet money on. In fact, I won several fifths of scotches on this. <sighs> By talking to talking to some of the traditional Eastern Catskill style tires, right, who want that hackle collar to be so stiff it bounce off the desk. Yep. But nobody fishes on the desk; they fish on the water. And I bet a guy a fifth of famous grouse one time. I said, "I'll bet you next time you go fishing with that Hendrickson tied with stiff hackle." Don't pick a fly up when it's six feet away. Let that fly float down next to your knee so you can take a close look at it. I'll bet you a fifth of scotch all the hackles on the bottom have poked through the surface. And that fly's abdomen is on the surface. He said, oh, no, that can't happen. we got to use that. And I said, shake on it. He shook. A month later, I got a memo from him, and he said, A.K.O., you fifth of famous grouse. You're right. <laughs> really? It's not the bottom hackle that supports the fly. It's the horizontal hackle. If uh, that's stiff, it'll float. That's why the parachute is so effective. Right. Huh. So how Anyway, you, I'm, I'm ranting no, on no, here. No, this is good. I love this. How do you... So how would you compare your dry... I guess we could look at the Colorado uh, Green Drake size 12 or, or, you know, or, or a pattern you tie. How would you compare that to a cat skills? How, how is it different than a typical dry cat skills fly? pattern i think the western western flies are have a couple more turns of hackle because we have faster water than uh, the normal streams in in the east they're pretty placid i mean the gradient 
you know, out mm-hmm. here, if you're, you're fishing a green drake hatch in white water. <laughs> or you can fish the green drake hatch in a slow pool. And when that happens, you clip all the hackle off the bottom. Yep. Uh, which also prevents leader twist on big flies. So that's one tip is that when you're fishing, if you're tying for a more of a pool and you're fishing dries, you're going to, you're going to actually cut those tips off on the bottom of the hackle. Right. Put it right down on the surface where the naturals are. There's not a mayfly in the universe that stands on its tippy toes. <laughs> <laughs> and so you want, so you want the, does it, maybe you can describe that, that abdomen in or out of the water. How do you want that fly to sit? If you're fishing a pool, a nice slow pool with a nice dry, a dry fly, how do you want that fly to sit on the water? I want the abdomen touching the surface. Okay. Like the natural. Yep. And one year, one year, just for the hell of it, uh, we have a lot of bluing olives, the bluing olives here in Colorado hatch pretty much year round now the the, the the seasons for the blueing olive have changed it used to start in late february and then it was late january and now you can find some size of blueing olive almost every month of the year but one time over in a frying pan i was having trouble getting fish to eat the fly i thought they were eating so i do this a lot i laid on my stomach on an undercut near an undercut bank and I watch these flies come by. And a moment, I guess it's called epiphany. Mm-hmm. Every one of those little bastards <laughs> was moving their legs as they floated by in a very slow current. I thought, oh, my God, they have to maintain balance. Mm-hmm. That's what we do when we're in the water. We're moving our arms and legs to maintain balance. So just for the pure hell of it. I tied a couple of blueing olives with soft hen hackle, two turns, because flies only have six legs. And the next time I went, I fished those flies in a very slow pool next to the bank. I caught a fish on every cast. Hmm. I don't know if it was the motion of the soft hackle or if that there was less hackle that looked more realistic. I'm not sure. But the soft hackle, I thought, was the key to it. So I've got in my bluing olive box, there's a half a dozen or more of uh, bluing olives from size 20 to 16 with two turns of soft hackle collar. Hmm. So, so a little collar on, and then you have the normal hackle as well, the little stiffer hackle. No, 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 just two turns, just two turns of soft hand hackle. Oh, wow. That's it. Yeah. And if you tie something, whose mass is lighter in weight than water, and you waterproof it, it's going to float. Soft soft presentation, of course. You're not going to slap it in the water. <laughs> You'll be a wet fly. So it's okay to tie a fly so you don't need that super stiff hackle. You don't you don't need that perfect dry fly hackle. Because you see these things out there, right? That you got this perfect dry fly hackle. It's a foot long. It's all stiff, all exact. Yeah. You, you don't have to have that. No. When I first started tying commercially, I bought number three Mets hackle because it all had a little web near the near the stem. Mm-hmm. When wound around the hook, it very nicely simulates the bigger thorax. The traditional Catskill fly has a very thin abdomen. There's no thorax. Hmm. I got talking one, one year at a fly show with uh, George Harvey. And uh, I had just given a fly to a guy who's uh, gone now, very famous, a quill body dry fly tied with Matt's hackle with the, with the, with the uh, web in the, next to the stem to simulate the thicker thorax. And he handed it to George Harvey, and George Harvey says, yeah, he said, it looks all right. You do your hackle all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but what I used to do is I'd tie that Matt's neck hackle on with the shiny side forward, which is not what you're supposed to do. Mm. That, And I'd take the first turn, I'd tie that down in front of the wings because now I'm building volume in front of the wings to prevent a thorax or to prevent a conical hackle. And then I'd take the first turn of hackle behind the wings, which made all the barbs bend to the rear. 
I'd take two turns behind the wings, and as I crossed forward to the front of the wings, the hackle would twist nicely, and so now all the barbs are facing forward, which provided the perfect imprint on the water because the rear pair of legs of every may fly extend almost to the end of the abdomen. The front pair of legs extend beyond the head. Hmm. It's the that's how they maintain the balance. It, it keeps their ass from getting wet. Hmm. There you go. There you go. What well, we've t- been talking about the um, the tips. Can you describe? I mean, do you typically use on your wings a uh, similar material a lot of the time, or how, how do you tie in a good? Because that's a struggle I think for a lot of people. Well, yeah, tie, I like to use hen wings, and uh, for years I tried to tie in the hen wings the way it suggested in all the books I had. And that was to line up the wing, the hen wing tips over the hook eye mm-hmm. and then start wrapping. But it always makes the wing tips twist around the hook. Yep. It was impossible to do. So just for a hell of a one time, I lined up the hackle with the wing tips to the rear. Now I got the butts in front of the wings. Take a quick turn, tighten quickly, and bingo. They're on top of the hook. Two turns, and then I put my fingernail behind those wing tips and push forward, and poof, they pop open, perfectly set hmm. in a V structure. And you take one turn of thread behind the far wing, pull it into position, take a turn in front to lock it in, come up behind the near wing, lock that in, and there's a. It takes five turns to set a pair of hen wings. There you go. What book um, would you do? You talk about that exact? Is that in production? In that book? I think it's in production. Tying. I've talked about it a lot during the fly shows and stuff. Yeah, I had people call me and say, "I've tried." Ak, you're right. It works every damn time. How come no one ever thought of this before? And I said, "Well, they weren't thinking." <laughs> <laughs> if you're having trouble doing something the way you're supposed to, then it must be something wrong with that method. The other thing you always have to be aware of when you're tying flies is no, I don't care what hatchery these necks come from, no two birds are exactly alike. No. The quills on no two birds are exactly alike. So the first thing you have to do when you start hackling a fly or tying in hen wings is determine what the rules are for that particular neck. Some, some, uh, some wings go on much easier than others. Some you have to fiddle around with and, ha- and learn the different, the slight difference in position that you put them on the hook or the hackle stem. Where does that like to be? So when you start wrapping the hackle, it all comes out the way you want. Right, right, right. I had, um, I just looking back, I had uh, Tom Whiting from Whiting Farms on in episode uh, 115. And he dug into, yeah. you know, he dug into the, he's kind of a nerdy uh, geneticist. And we talked a lot oh, about, yeah. about how were these materials, how he gets them to way, how they are. But it sounds like from your experience, you know, that you don't need necessarily a perfect uh, dry fly hackle to tie the flies that you, you describe in your books. Well, what's a perfect dry fly? Yeah. I mean, I think of that when I think of perfect, I think of like Tom described <clears throat> these perfectly. They're all exactly the same length. They're all, they're all just oh, per- yeah. Oh, you know that, what I mean? I like that. I like that because I tie with his saddles. You can get 12 yeah. flies out of one saddle feather. Yep. And uh, the hackles, the hackle fibers on his saddles are pretty much all the same length from near the tip to near the butt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I save all the tips. If, the, if I'm tying with a size 18 hackle, I'll save the tip because now that's a 20. <laughs> yep. There you go. But uh, the the typical bottle brush hackle that we've all seen for so many years isn't required. Yep. There was, in fact, there was a time in the, in the uh, late seventies when hackle dry fly hackle was rare to have any good stuff. There were a few razors, and you had to be on the you had to be on good friends with the ro- grower to get any hackle. So a lot of people were importing India rooster necks. They were little short things. They'd take three or four sixteens to hackle an Adams. Uh, and then people were going and tying using 14-size hackle and trimming it with the scissors to make it a 16. <laughs> yep. 
I, I remember doing that. I've, I've <laughs> well, and it sounds like trimming. You're not totally against trim. I mean, some people might say you never trim a dry fly hackle, but you're not against it. Oh, I do it a lot. If I want my fly down on the surface, uh, uh, and I, I have fully hackle all my flies unless I'm tying a parachute. But if I'm getting to a, if I come to a pool that's really slow and, and looks like a mirror, I'll clip all the hackle off the bottom because I want that fly on the surface. Yeah. Is that the only time you do that? Clip, that's mean, about the only time. The the only the only other time you want to trim the hackle off the bottom is if you're using a large fly like a drake, a green drake or a brown drake, and you're finding the fly is twisting your tippet. Clip all the hackle off the bottom, mm. and that'll that'll usually prevent hackle twist. That's a good or a tippet twist. That's a good tip. I had a question here from Gary in the uh, in the Facebook group as well. He. He uh, wanted to ask you, he, he said, um, could you describe how to tie your favorite dry fly? <clears throat> Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, you have a, do, you, do, you, do you have a favorite dry fly? Uh, yeah. I, well, I have two, actually. One is what I call the St. Vrain caddis. Uh, years ago, all the hatches in the state are changing as, as the climate changes. Uh, Years ago, up on the St. Brain near Lyons, there was a pale yellow-bodied caddisfly with light tan, almost ecru wings. And it was a killer fly up there. And I had a, I had three sizes. I had 18s, 16s, and 14s. I carried those all the time. And whenever I got to a stream where I couldn't catch fish, I'd tie on a, a St. Brain caddis. And it always worked. It's a very pale yellow body, uh, lighter in color than a lemon, uh, lighter in color than the yellow sticket notes. It's very, very pale yellow. When you treat that with gink or something, it'll darken a little bit and take on a pale green hue. And it looks just exactly like the green hue in the in the natural's body. The uh, wing is bleached elk, very light, and the hackle is medium ginger. And uh, here's another thing about tying caddisflies: most people tie caddisflies with enough hair on them to tie three flies. <laughs> when the <laughs> when a caddis is on the water, it's Immediate intent is to get off. They don't float very long, and they start busting their wings. I've made this comment to a lot of a lot of people I've taught. When you tie the wing on your caddis fly, look down from the top. If you can't see the body, you've got too much hair. You should be able to see the body of that fly through the top of the wing by looking down on it. Now you've got a fluttering wing. Great tip. That's what they do. That's a great tip. I think of the, uh, whenever I think of caddis, I always think of the elk hair caddis just because it's such a common fly I've used over the oh, years. Yeah. And that one's yeah. one where you can go crazy with the, with the elk hair. You, you, you know, you could put a chunk of on there that's so, but you don't, you're saying you, you don't need that in elk hair either to float it or any of that? None of that stuff on top floats the fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. That's eyewash. We had another term for that in the army. Uh, <laughs> But it's eyewash. None of that stuff on top holds that fly above the water. What holds the fly above the water are three or four hairs on either side of the fly hmm. and the hackle. Yep, that's it. That makes that keeps it simple. In fact, when you when you when you tie a caddis, there used to be a famous pattern in Colorado called the Colorado caddis, and it had a pair of tails. Two. Uh, one moose main fiber on either side of the hook at the end simulated the rear pair of legs. Because when you see those flies on the water, the rear pair of legs are always extending beyond the back of the body. That fly has gone out of popularity for some strange reason. I don't know, but we used to tie a lot of those. And that was one of the reasons it was so effective. It was the footprint it left on the water, how long, however briefly it was there. My other favorite fly is a uh, red quill parachute. Uh -huh. Red quill parachute in a size 18. It's a great 
prospecting fly because it looks like a lot of other stuff. The closest thing it resembles is a uh, is a spent bluing olive. But over on the frying pan, if I, there was no hatch, I'd tie on a size 18 red quill parachute and always catch a few fish. I'm looking at one here now. Um, I'm not sure if this was one of your patterns, but can you describe, um, just from the start and the tail end, describe what, what you use on that fly? Okay, for tailing, I've gone strictly to using uh, Whiting's uh, Coq de Leon saddle. Mm -hmm. That stuff is so, those fibers are so stiff you can almost hurt yourself with them. And they're very long. Mm -hmm. Spinners and parachutes all have a little longer tail than the dun. That helps to support the fly in the water. Uh, and sparse. You don't have to have a, a ton of fibers in the tail. Mayflies only have three tails at most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> and then the body, for all my quill body flies now, I'm using stripped and dyed white turkey saddle. You strip it and you strip in Clorox and water and then dye it. Mm -hmm. I, I buy the I buy the the white turkey saddle feathers, uh, five to seven inch length. You can get three flies off one feather. Starting at the very tip, you can get a size twenty, then an eighteen, and then a sixteen. Very very economic. You you probably won't be able to find that in many fly shops because they call it turkey flat turkey flats. But what they're calling turkey flat is actually a turkey T base. The T base feather is only two to three inches long and very, very thick webbed out to the tips. Turkey flats are five to seven inches long. Oh, but the turkey T base grows on the neck and breast of the bird. Turkey flats are in the saddle region. They're longer and wider. But most, most people don't know what they're selling. I learned this from a feather merchant in California who, who sells feathers to everybody in the universe who uses feathers. <laughs> <laughs> and now a quick word from our sponsors. Gotfishing.com, a boutique booking agency for fishing adventures around the world. Got Fishing is unique at working with a small hand-selected group of outfitters from around the world that are known for providing an experience that is second to none. Got Fishing can be your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. Their sole purpose is to help you plan the most authentic fishing adventure while making sure it fits within your budget. The beauty is that everything they do is 100% free. You will never pay a dime extra for your trip, and in many cases, less than advertised. I can attest personally to the service that Got Fishing provides as they have been working with me closely to set my first trip to the Yucatan for saltwater. They have taken care of all the important details and allowed me to avoid worrying about any of the complications. I know Brian and the crew have you covered at Got Fishing. Whether you need a fishing consultant, travel consultant, gear pro, or the like, they have you covered. With top of the line outfitters they represent around the world, they are confident they have just the right trip for you. You can give them a call at 208-630-3373 or head over to gotfishing.com to get started today. Let Got Fishing help you plan the fishing trip you've been dreaming about. That's gotfishing.com. Okay, back to the show. Cool. I was just looking, um, I was just kind of looking at some of your flies on online. You've got some stuff in Fly Tire. I guess this is Fly Tire Magazine. Have you written... Um, I wanted to dig into some some more on on these tips. You've, you've, we've dug into some great stuff here so far, but um, I did want to touch on a little more of your background um, as far as tie, sure. you know, books and things. So, can you describe the books? Maybe some of the books that you've written, and then uh, and then ha where else you've written over the years? Well, the magazines I used to write for was uh, Bamboo Fly Rod, which is a short lived magazine. <laughs> Then I wrote for Fly Rod and Reel Web, a virtual fly shop. That was a motto. Fly Rod and Reel, Fly Tire, uh, Mid Atlantic Fly Fishing Guide, which is no longer in existence. Mm -hmm. I wrote for them for years. Lefty Cray and all of those famous oh, yeah. Eastern tires were writing for it. I was in pretty good company. <laughs> the books I've written are. are Production Fly Tying, that's in third edition. 
fly tying with AK, dyeing and bleaching natural materials, that's in second edition. AK's fly box, advanced fly tying and fly fishing with AK. One, two, three, four, five, six, <clears throat> seven, eight, nine books. Nine books. Wow. And are you, do you have more books? Uh, I'm not sure when you wrote your last one. Are you planning on more? I've written everything I know. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says, what's your next book about? And I say, I don't know anymore. It's all there. Uh, so, what I know is there. Yeah. That's great. You never stop learning, but that's I good. haven't acquired enough information to start on another one. That's great. That's great. That's good. Um, I did want to touch on too. You know, you talked about your music background. I know you have. You, you noted that you've. You know, that was a big part of your life. Can you talk about? Um, you know, your music. I know. Uh, maybe you can just describe what what type of music and start there, and then we can dig into a little more of its influence on your life. All right. Uh, I was raised on an Iowa farm. Learned how to play the saxophone because I had hay fever and I knew I would never be a farmer. So I spent hours a day practicing my alto, my alto sax. And uh, there was a time when I was still in high school where I had my own little band. My dad played the banjo, my mom played piano, and my aunt played the piano accordion. We had a drummer from the town nearby called Carol. And so we played a few barn dances. Back, this back in the days when a farmer would build a new barn and they'd have a barn dance. So that's what we, we had our own little PA system and uh, they had the bales of hay. It was very typical movie style, <laughs> bales of hay to set on and a horse tank full of ice water and beer. <laughs> uh, did that for a few years. And then I went to Drake University as a music major on my alto sax. And uh, I thought I was the best player in the county when I was in high school, and I was. But then I got to Drake, and I found everybody there is the best player in their county. Yep, yep. <laughs> and some of, them, some of them are a lot better than me. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time in the practice room again. And the word got out, and I got asked to play uh, in a little band in Des Moines, uh, an organization called Zarno Entertainment. But I needed a tenor. So I borrowed a tenor from somebody and uh, played in this band for a little while. Three tenors, uh, one trumpet, string bass, piano and drums. Three, we used to tease it as three moaning tenors. It was, the, it was locally re referred to as a hotel sound. Hmm. And we played, uh, we played for dances, we played for shows, we played for Elks Club, the Moose Club, the Kiwanis Club, we played new car openings where they'd rent an entire theater and I could go down there, skip class and make enough money in three days to pay for tuition. <laughs> and uh, then I got asked to play for more and more because I, like I said before, I could sight read. I ended up playing lead alto on a band out of Ames that traveled all over the country. And, uh, it was a fun band. What is al what is alto? Alto sax is slightly smaller than a tenor sax. Oh, okay. So it's just a type of saxophone. Yeah, type and, of. You're not in music at all, are you? No. Well, <laughs> I mean, I no, not really. I have a little guitar mess around, but no, I don't. What? What? So is this like jazz? What? What type of general music would you say? It was. Uh, it was dance music. So so dance. If we wanted to find something like Google something online and see. I don't know if you have. You probably don't have anything out there. But what would you what would you search to find to listen to something that similar to what you what you used to do? Okay, Google big band era. Okay, big band that that clarify. Yeah, I know what you're talking about now. And uh, we we played pretty much the same kind of music. A lot of the records that those famous bands were making were more concert music, but they did play. They those bands used to travel the country. And play the big ballrooms. Mm. And uh, in Des Moines, we had a private club because Des Moines, Iowa was a dry state in those years. But we had a private club called the Venetian Room. It was all, the whole membership was musicians. 
and you go to the state liquor store, buy your bottle of Canadian Club, take it up there, they put a number on it, and then you'd pay 50 cents for an ice cube and some of your own booze. <laughs> but when those big bands came to town, there'd always be a jam session down at the Venetian Room. That'd last till 8 o'clock the next morning. So my claim to fame is this. One night, Woody Herman band was in town. And of course, we're having a jam session down at the Venetian Room afterwards. I'm about the last guy sitting at the bar, and Woody comes up and sits down next to me. And I said, he said, are you AK Best? And I said, yes, sir, I am. By the way, your band was really nice and tight tonight. He said, thank you. I hear you can sight read. And I said, yes, sir, I can. His next question was, do you want a job? I said, oh, I just got my draft notice Oh, two weeks ago. He said, well, good luck with that. Good luck with that. And he got up and left. I hated the U.S. Army, the U.S. government, the huh. United States of America. That was my dream about to come true, and it was taken away. Years later, it occurred to me, the U.S. Army saved my life. All those guys are dead. They OD'd on something. Is that Woody? Woody Herman. Woody Herman, okay. All those guys are dead by ODing on something. That was in the era when musicians had already discovered marijuana and a whole lot of other drugs. And they all they all got a pure shot one time and it knocked them down. So by getting drafted, it took me out of that culture. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I'm still alive and they're all dead. There Thank you, you, Uncle Sam. There you go. <laughs> <Save my life. laughs> I, I was going to ask you a little bit, uh, a little on that. You know, um, I, I think I heard you maybe on another interview or talking about like Benny's alcohol smoking and a part of your life that sounds like was part of this era. Can you, can you talk about like, bring us to that, that part of your life and what that was like and how that's maybe different from, I remember when John, I had John on, it, you know, maybe you guys were together at the same time, but he mentioned how he, I think he quit. Uh, drinking and uh, doing all that stuff, you know, many, many years ago. Did you come to the same realization? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one night, uh, Saturday night, we had a job at the Savory Hotel in downtown Des Moines. The trumpet player in the band was a good friend of mine. And so now it's it's only one thirty in the morning. Who's going to go to, what musician goes to bed at that time? So I went up to my apartment. I had a six-pack of Budweiser left. And I always had that for Sunday. You couldn't buy beer or anything on Sunday. <laughs> we listened to records and drank up all my beer Saturday night. I got up about noon Sunday and went to the fridge for a beer, and it was none gone. And I went to my bathroom to light a cigarette, and my hand was shaking. Mm. And I thought, oh, no. I quit drinking, and I didn't have a drink for about six months. <laughs> Because I was that close to becoming an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Now I like now I have one or two drinks a day, just to keep the doctor away. <laughs> yeah, yep. What's your drink of choice today? Canadian Club. Oh, Canadian Club. Canadian so, whiskey. Oh, whiskey. Right, right. Gotcha. Yep. And uh, and then the the smoking is uh, something. Or what would you say? You know now, or what are you, some of your vices that you are still you know uh, partake in, or something that you think is a vice. Uh, I smoke little filter tip cigars, mm -hmm. less than a pack a day. They're about the size of a pack of king size cigarettes. Uh, I go to see my doctor for my hundred thousand mile checkup every spring. Yep. And she said, well, your blood oxygen is still 98%. I'm supposed to tell you, you shouldn't smoke, but why would I say that now? You've already won. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and. You know, yeah. So I have a few of those every day. As uh, maybe it's a little bit of my rebellious nature. When yeah. somebody says I can't do something, a little flag goes up and says, well, "Why are you telling me what I can't do?" I obey the laws and all that, and I go to church and all that. Mm -hmm. But if some man makes a law that I think offends my independency, I'll try ways to get around it without breaking the law. Right. 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 Right now, of course, in Colorado, we're sheltered because of this coronavirus. Yeah. 
And my wife and I are sheltering in our little town home here, and I have neighbors bringing in groceries, and another neighbor again, another neighbor bringing in my Canadian club, and mm-hmm. my wife likes red wine. He's bringing her a bottle of Malbec, and uh, we're okay. Yeah, you'd be okay if the uh, this Corona thing went on for another couple of months, or even got worse. As long as I can get my my Canadian club and so. <laughs> Groceries are fine. <laughs> All right. And my little cigars. Gotcha. Okay. The supply chain. You got to have a supply chain. <laughs> exactly. And what would happen? So if that supply chain got cut off because of all this crazy, crazy stuff, how would that, how would that feel? I have no idea. I know. I guess I'd have to, I'd have to tough it out somehow. Yeah. Yeah. You'd, you'd survive. No, it's, I, it's interesting. I mean, I think that uh, I occasionally ask that question about vices and things like that because I think it, you know, every, everybody has them. Everybody has a different thing, you know, for your thing is this. And oh, that, yeah. You know what I mean? Like we all have it and it's just a matter of, I think, like you said, if you're, if you're healthy and you're, you know, you're not hurting anybody, then I don't see anything wrong with any of that stuff. Yeah. Well, all things in proper propriety, you can do anything as long as you don't overdo it. Mm-hmm. Including the vices. I just, you know, I'm, I'm way too old now to be be lounging around in the bars. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how how old are you now? 87. Oh, 87. Wow. You're, see, I thought you were, I was thinking you were younger. That's interesting. So you're still, I've interviewed a few people in the, let's see, probably the oldest person I interviewed so far was 95. Um, um, I Who's believe, that? Uh, well, I've interviewed a couple. Actually, I interviewed Joan Wolf. Um, oh who, yeah, Joan. Yeah, I've watched her. Yeah, yeah, Joan Wolf. I'm trying to think of how old she is now. I'm, I, I'd have to look. I'll put a link to the show. She's got to be in her. She's got to be in her 90s. Yeah, I think she is. I'll put a link into that interview. Um, I also interviewed Frank Moore, who's a big steelhead guy out here in the Northwest, and uh, he was 90. I think he was 94 at the time. And yeah. uh, and I. I did that interview in person and I remember shaking his hand and his hand was, you know, he was like, he was crushing my hand, you know? So, I mean, I think 87, (laughs) I think 87 seems like, it just doesn't seem like as old as it, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of 90 year old people that are doing fine. Yeah. Well, it's the outdoor life, you know, we, we all partook. I'm sure we've all partaken in some things that were not smiled upon by the rest of society. But all things in moderation. That was a term I was looking for a yeah, while ago. That's right. All things in moderation is what <clears> keeps <throat> you going. Uh, when I lived on the farm and as a young kid in Iowa, there was a guy, a neighbor, who uh, who said that his doctor said he should quit drinking and smoking because one hardens the arteries and one mm-hmm. softens. That <laughs> he said <laughs> jokingly, "I've been hardening and softening all my life." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. My goal is is to be able to still wait a trout stream when I'm ninety. Yeah. Have you have you slowed down? Have you noticed the slowing down of your your fishing over the over the years? Well, yeah, yeah. A lot of it depends on the damn weather, which runoff sometimes is over during the early part of June. Sometimes it lasts till the first of September. Oh wow. Uh, last year I fished once we were up in, uh, Bozeman, Montana, visiting a daughter and my wife was hospitalized with a bleeding ulcer. They couldn't stop because she has a mechanical heart valve and they can't take her off blood thinner. All right. And, and, uh, or she'd die. And, uh, but I said, you got to stop the bleeding. And she had 15 blood transfusions. Wow. While there along with a little bag of saline that goes with it, which collected in her thighs and nearly paralyzed her, but she's, she's getting better now. So we didn't get back. We went up there August 2nd and got back to Boulder October 1st. The best time to be fishing. So, but while we were in Bozeman, I fished with a guy up there who's, uh, runs a fishing thing, uh, wounded warriors. Mm -hmm. And he, his wife is a good friend of my daughter's. And so he found out I was coming and he said, I'd like to take you fishing. I said, yeah, but I'm not wounded. And I'm not really a warrior. He said, that's all right. You've been fine. <laughs> I want to take you fishing anyway. 
<laughs> so he went out in his little boat and we each caught one fish on a little lake and uh, neither one of us could figure it out. There's a midge hatch, about a size 14 midge of all things. And uh, we couldn't figure out what phase they were taking, the spent, the emerging, the nymph or whatever. Uh, but we each caught one and we thought that was out of pure dumb luck. So that's the fish I caught last year. Hmm. This year, we have huge snowpack again. We're way over 100% of snowpack in the mountains. So runoff will start, who knows, early, late. I like to get up in Rocky Mountain Park uh, just as runoff is beginning. There's a little stream up there where the big spawners come out of excuse me, Estes Lake. They come all the way up out of Estes Lake into the park. I've caught 27-inch brown trout. You can spit it in a stream. You can spit across. Jeez. And it's uh, on a on a on a beetle. Another invention of mine called the wing beetle. Did you know every beetle on the water has a pair of wing tips sticking out? Oh, you know, I know. I've seen that on some. I didn't know everyone had that. Every beetle. Remember when you were a kid and you caught a ladybug and you crawled it on one knuckle and then on the other yep. knuckle? Oh, yeah. I still do that. Finally, the, the lady, <laughs> yeah, the ladybug would get tired of that. The wing case would split, and just a split second later, a pair of wings pop out, it's gone. No one's ever photographed that. But we've all seen it. <clears throat> While lying on my stomach, like I mentioned before, watching bugs come by, every beetle. I've ever seen on the water, be it a ladybug or a black beetle, has a pair of wingtips sticking out the back end. It's about 30% of the total profile. Hmm. So I've been tying what I call the wing beetle with a short pair of wingtips. The wingtips only stick out about the length of a hook gap space. They can't go and be gone. They're stuck in the surface film. Mm-hmm. When you fish a beetle like that, you're going to catch. I fished that beetle during the green drake hatch on the frying pan and caught fish. I fished that beetle down in a southern stream where all the all the fish had been poisoned by a chemical spill. I caught fish on that wing beetle down there. And the guy said, we don't have black beetles down here. And I said, well, tell these fish that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I go up in the Rocky Mountain Park with a dozen size 14 black wing beetles. And I'll come out with three or four. The rest were not in the bushes. The rest are held in the mouth of fish. The little stream it just goes wingy, wingy, whiny back through the through the meadow, and every corner goes back about three feet, and the bottom is about two, three feet deep. Those damn big trout know what to do with that leader. They wrap it around roots, and you're gone. Mm. You never catch you never catch a little fish in one of those bend pools. Mm-hmm. But you'll lose a lot of flies there. Hmm. The the time to go is in the morning before the sun hits the water. And if you find grass hanging in the water, make that beetle hit the grass, jiggle it a little bit, get the fish to tend in. The beetle falls in; it'll float about four inches, and somebody's got it. Okay. And is that wing beetle that has rubber legs on it? No, no. It's uh, four four turns of black hackle. There's a product called bug skin. It's a byproduct of the, of the fancy leather goods industry. There's a friend of mine who goes to those places and gathers all the scrap, and he sells this stuff in packages called bug skin. It's dyed black. It soaks up water repellent beautifully, and it'll stay right at the surface after you catch a fish. Don't use what we call fairy dust or squeeze it in a chamois skin. The fairy dust dehydrates the water out of the fish line. As soon as that fly hits the water, it's going to soak up water again. If you use a chamois to blot the fish slime off, you're squeezing that stuff down into the fly, and it won't float again. But if you use something like gink or some of these uh, hydroponic products. Hydroponic means repels water. Mm -hmm. If you catch a fish and your fly is slimy, false cast it so it slaps the water a couple times. 
that will dislodge all the fish line. Hmm. Your next your next cast forward is a floating fly. Nice. I've got flies in my fly box I've ginked four years ago. That stuff doesn't evaporate. Water does. Yep. It evaporates out of the stuff and leaves the slime on the fly. <laughs> there you go. I I was looking, uh, taking it back, you know, on the on the tying, I had another note here from uh, Jack Kovich who, who wanted to ask, um, you know, how to keep beginners from frustration when talking about dry flies. Do you have any tips for people that maybe are just getting started that, you know, maybe they're looking at some of your flies and they're just thinking like, how the heck do I tie that wing on there? Do you have any tips for a brand new tire? Brand new tire? Yeah. The somebody best who's new. thing they can do is go... Best thing they could do it if there's a fly shop nearby that offers classes, take them. Yeah. Or or if there's a big fly uh, fishing event taking place near where they live, sign up for a fly tying class, no matter who's teaching it. You'll always learn something. I used to do a lot of those, but I, I, you just get beat up. Yeah. It's a, it's <laughs> I, I can't. I can't. I don't have the stamina for that anymore. But yeah, it uh, practice, practice, practice. Tie a fly if it doesn't look like. Get a razor blade, scalp the hook, and do it again. Uh huh. Take if you have a camera that'll take close up pictures, take a picture of it. If you have a camera, then you're fishing. Take pictures of the naturals. Best thing you can do is to take a picture of the natural. Okay. Now here's another little here's another little hint. When you're out fishing and there's a mayfly hatch on, you should always be carrying something like an aquarium net so you can net those little suckers. Mm -hmm. Take a picture of it from the bottom side, not the side or the top. That's not the the side trout see. Take a picture of it, hold the fly by the wings, and shoot it bottom up. (laughs) Now you know what the fly really looks like. Right. What is... Um, I mean, you talked about a couple of flies. I guess we can, as we start to think about kind of wrapping this thing up here, um, I usually kind of start that off with the 222, which is top two tips, top two flies, top two resources. And you mentioned a couple of flies. Um, were there, uh, was there, were those your top two flies? If you had to pick two dry flies, say you're out there in Colorado, and we haven't even talked about the, I think you had an article or on breaking down Colorado top dry flies. Um, I don't know if you want to grab a, a couple from there, but what would you say are your top two dry flies? My top two dry flies are the olive quill dun, the blowing olive imitation, the red quill parachute, and the St. Rain caddis. Okay, good. Uh, and, the, and the wing beetle. And the wing beetle, okay. And um, and as we're talking, if we, if we take one of those flies, are there any, you know, as far as tying dry flies, tips on tying dry flies, anything come to mind that might help somebody tie? I don't know if you want to pick one of those patterns and, and talk about you know, a couple tips. What was the first one you said? We, we talked about, I guess, a couple of them already, but the olive quill, what was the first one? Uh, the bit, the most important tip I can give anybody is tie with enough thread tension that almost breaks the thread. That's the way you're, the, that's the way you're only ever going to get a firmly tied fly that doesn't come loose. Perfect. Perfect. So start the thread on a hook pull on it until the thread breaks. Now you know how strong it is. Yep. And don't start out using some of these new threads that people are going ape over. It's 10 aught thread. <laughs> it's too fine. Mm-hmm. It takes more turns to hold anything on the hook. Start with 6 aught thread. It's very strong. You can tie on five fibers of tailing with five turns of thread in a 6 aught, And you can't pull the fibers out. Yep. If you're using eight odd thread, it's going to take eight turns of thread. Now you're using up time. If you're using ten turn ten odd thread, it's going to take twelve turns of thread. You're using more thread and using more time, and you are not being effective in your time. In fact, there's a few guys who are so anal. There are some guys who are so anal they'll even burn some monofilament and time in as the eyes. Oh right. On a mayfly because they do have eyes, and some of them are very prominent. But that's more for the fly buyer than the fish. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm glad you touched on the thread because uh, Nick Cobbler also was asking. He wanted you to 
let us know what your your the the thread you go with the type and color and it sounds like you like six do you have a type of color or a brand you like to use danville six aught thread has all the colors that perfectly match everything i've ever needed to tie there you go some of the newer threads the newer threads like an olive turns black when you put uh, uh head cement on it mm. and by the way here's another pet peeve i have a lot of people say, well, they don't bother with head cement. They just use five turns of the, of the yep. five turns of thread. That's going to come apart. And they say, well, my flies never come apart. And I, my answer to that is you're not fishing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. even, the, even the flies with head cement on will come apart if you catch enough fish on that fly. Yep. I, want, I, want the, I don't want a fly to come apart while I'm fishing. No. If I lose a fly, I want it to be in a bush or a, or a fish. <laughs> yeah. How do you keep them other than using head cement and tight wraps? Is there any other tips on durability, making sure that fly lasts? Yeah, tying in with extreme tension. Everything you tie on a hook should be at breaking strength That's it. of the thread. That's it. And whatever you tie on the hook, you have to first use thread torque as your friend. You don't set something on top of the hook and tie it on. The t- it'll spin around. So lean it towards you. Mm-hmm. Then take a loose loop and then gradually tighten it until it's re- almost ready to break. Just uh, finishing up that 222, the other one was kind of top two resources. And other than your own stuff, you know, you've got a lot of, lots of stuff we've talked about for dry flies. Any other, you know, books, magazines, any other resources you'd recommend people check out? Well, some of some of the books I used to count on, the guys are no longer alive. Paul Jorgensen wrote a wonderful book. Vince Marinero wrote that great book on, on the Ring of the Rise. Mm-hmm. Paul Jorgensen wrote a couple of great books. Uh, Selective Trout is another great one. Okay. Uh, Swisher Richards. Oh, all right. uh, that's when they came up with the the hackleless fly. Oh, nice. So there you go. How does a, uh, and is that a hackleless, uh, hackleless dry fly? The no hackle fly. Yeah. 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 How, how does that one? I watched. Yeah. Well, here's an interesting thing about that fly. Mike Lawson and Renee Harrop, the two gurus on the Henry Schwartz in Idaho. I watched uh, Mike Lawson tie one of those flies one time and I said, okay, when you fish that, what do you do? And he took his thumbnail and he broke that wing all apart. <laughs> mm-hmm. He said, now I've got fibers down in the water, simulating legs, and there's enough sticking up to look like a wing. No, oh, there you go. But what sells that fly is a perfect wing profile. And, uh, but he said, no, he said, I, 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 I destroy the wing before I fish it. There you go. Some of the mayflies. You know, some mayflies have a little short wing called a double wing fly. A little short wing in front of the bigger, taller wing. Oh. So I watched Mike Lawson tie a double wing quill no hack a fly. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it looks so damn good. Huh. <clears throat> he, and, he and Renee Harrop are the masters of that pattern. Yeah, so there is some stuff online right here. Um, I'll, I'll put a link in the yeah. show notes. There's a Henry's Fork uh, Anglers has something on the. Oh yeah, there it is. It's that's a cool looking. Yeah, yeah. Henry's Fork and there's, oh yeah. There's a little. They have a little write up on Mike Loss, and I'll, I'll put a. I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, AK. Before we get out of here, I, I just had one other note I want to check in. You know, John uh, Gearrock, like we noted, he's he definitely said a lot of great things about you and the influence you had on him. I was kind of wanting to oh. swing it around and, and and take it back to John. I mean, I know. He's such a big uh, person in fly fishing with all of his writings. When when you think of him, oh, I mean, yeah. what what influence did he have? Any influence on your the direction of where you went in fly fishing and tying? Uh, I guess we had a, we both shared a love for bamboo rods hmm. and uh, and matching the hatch and wading carefully. Like you're part of the natural environment. He's 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 very good. In fact, I wrote an article one time called Fishing Gear Out's Pockets. And we were up on the St. Rain, and there was a nice blowing olive hatch on. We flipped a coin to see who went upstream first. And he won, of course, and he started out. He hadn't gone 10 feet, and there's a trout rose right behind him. So 
I stood behind him and I started, <laughs> I, went, I caught the damn trout. And I thought, wow, I'm fishing in his pocket. But so if you wade carefully, you don't disturb the fish. That's a myth. Uh, uh, I've, I've, a lot of what I learned about fish activity is watching the damn things. Don't just jump in the water and start fishing. Watch and see what happens. There was a hatch down the South Platte one year, blowing out of a hatch. And uh, there's a crease on the other side. These fish were lined up in this little current crease about 30 feet long. And I went for the bottom one because I see that little sailboat down there. And I netted a fish near me or a fly near me. And it was a size 18 blooming olive. I tied one on. I couldn't catch the fish. Couldn't. 20 casts. So I waited over there very slowly, very carefully. And I could see trout move out of my way. These are 18, 20 inch fish. Didn't spook and dart away. They moved out of my way. I netted the water. And guess what I found? It was blooming olive all right, but it was a spinner with the wings upright. Hmm. Different color body. Yep. So I went back to my truck, tied a couple of what I call not quite spinner. Went back down there and it caught the fish on yep. the first cast. Nice. <laughs> but caref careful waiting, careful waiting is so important. Yep, that that is a good tip. So you're saying with uh, John Gearock, you caught or, or on that the couple you've caught fish right behind people. That's not a problem. Yeah. Well, and we fished together a lot. Uh, we learned. I learned a lot about riding from him. Uh, one of the neat things I, he got this quote from some other writer. Yeah. He said, "When you write, when you write a story, start it out by saying, Dear John." When you get all done, sincerely yours, and then erase both heading and, and closing, then you have a story. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to webflyswing.com slash 137. A reminder on the new podcast that uh, we just launched, um, if you get a chance, it'd be awesome if you could take a, take a listen, outdoorsonline.co, or share it with somebody you know who has a business or wants to start a company in the uh, fly fishing or outdoor space. Thanks again for stopping by today to check out the show. Looking forward to catching up soon. Hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.